All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. So good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for the second session of the six part Forming Youth Leaders webinar training series. Tonight's session is focused on a topic that's very close to us in our ministry, and that's discipleship. Specifically, how do we live out our lives as disciples? And then how do we use our ministries to create disciples of those that we are serving? This evening, it's wonderful to see, I'm looking through the attendee list, I see a variety of different roles that are with us, and I think that's really important. Um, so welcome to the current MYO advisors that are with us tonight, the, the MYO leaders in training, uh, the MYA leaders. I also see some MYA board members as well and clergy. So welcome to you all. We're also very blessed this evening to have uh, both of our bishops actually joining us. We have Bishop Gregory Mansour from the Eparchy of St. Marin and Bishop Elias Zaiden for the Eparchy of Our Lady of Lebanon. So welcome to you both, Your Excellencies. This webinar training series, as was the first session that we had and the next several, is being hosted by the Office for Maronite Youth and Young Adults from the Eparchy of St. Marin of Brooklyn. This office is comprised of several individuals who have been collaborating and working uh, for many months now in an effort to support the different youth programs um, of our eparchy, but specifically on the local level. So very quickly, what I'd like to do to start off is to put a face to their names, um, especially because many of you on the parish level over the next several months are going to be interacting with some of these individuals so you can see who makes up our eparchial board for this office for youth and uh, young adults and who you can reach out to if you ever have any questions or concerns. So first I'm going to, let me get the list up here. All right. So I'm gonna first start off with Sister Therese Maria. She's the director uh, for our eparchy. Hi, sister. Next, we'll jump to Camelia Namor. I just have to find your names on the list. Here you are. Uh, Camelia is from New Jersey and she's a parish support coordinator. So she'll be working directly with many of our parishes on the local level over the next several months. We have Tony Risha. There he is. Hey, Tony. Tony's also from New Jersey and he is our secretary and logistics coordinator for the office. Next, we'll jump to New York and we have Frances Moraney. And there she is. She is another one of our parish support coordinators. Maria Harb is the newest addition to our team. Um, she comes from Raleigh, North Carolina. Hi, Maria. We also have Father Vincent Farhat, who couldn't be with us tonight, but he is um, the clergyman that's on our board. Uh, myself, Christian Haita, I'm a seminarian for the eparchy and, and overseeing the training and certification programs that we're running. And lastly, we have Tamara Auschwitz-Fetti from Pittsburgh. Um, she is our social media coordinator. She's actually gonna be kicking us off tonight with an opening prayer. So Tamara, whenever you're ready. All right, Christian, thank you so much. Um, so tonight I wanna to start us off with our opening prayer, um, a prayer to the Holy Spirit that's been on my heart today by St. Augustine. And it says, Breathe in me, O Holy Spirit, that my thoughts may all be holy. Act in me, O Holy Spirit, that what my work too may be holy. Draw my heart, O Holy Spirit, that I love only what is holy. Strengthen me, O Holy Spirit, to defend all that is holy. Guard me then, O Holy Spirit, that I always may be holy. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And I hope that tonight we keep our minds and hearts open um, and let the Holy Spirit work through our discussion and through this session. Thank you, Tamara. Thank you for that beautiful opening prayer. So now I have the pleasure of introducing tonight's speaker. Uh, Dr. Scott Powell is going to be our presenter for the evening. Dr. Powell is a teacher, a theologian, and an author. He is the director of the Aquinas Institute uh, for Catholic Thought and Outreach to the University of Colorado in Boulder. 
and is also an affiliate of the Benson Center for the Study of Western Civilization, Thought and Policy at the University of Colorado. He has also taught at the Augustine Institute and the St. John Vianney Theological Seminary's Catholic Bible School. He and his wife, Annie, found, the, found Camp Vostila, a Catholic outdoor adventure program for youth based in the Colorado Rocky Mountains. Scott also co-hosts and produces the popular podcast called The Word on the Hill with the Lanky Guys, and has appeared in numerous Catholic productions, including Symbolon, Beloved, Reborn, Why Disciple, and the Opening of the Word series. He has been featured on EWTN, Catholic Answers Live, and several other Catholic outlets. He holds a doctorate in Catholic studies from Maryville Institute, Liverpool, Hope University in England. Scott is also the author of, an, of the book titled An Environmental Ethic for the End of the World, an Ecological Midrash on Romans 8, 19 to 22, which was recently published by Cambridge Scholars Publishing. Scott and his wife live near Boulder, Colorado with their three children, Lily Avila, Samuel Isaac, and Evelyn Luca. Dr. Powell, we welcome you and we thank you for being with us tonight. And I'm gonna go ahead and turn this over to you. There you are. Thank you very much. I'm so honored to be here. Um, and I am going to, <laughs> I'm gonna make a request of you guys. You can feel free to reject it completely, but um, it's been however many months it's been, but I still have a hard time getting used to uh, Zoom and the platform. And you know, there was a time where all my classes had to move over here. And so I should be used to it by now, but I'm not. Um, and so I'm trying my best to be tech savvy, but because we're talking about discipleship tonight and because I am of the opinion that discipleship is a pretty fundamentally incarnational reality, that requires people being with people. And I know we can't do that obviously right now. Um, I wonder if you guys would be open to turning on your videos. I know there was a very strict um, opening slide at the beginning that said, turn off your video, turn off your, you know, mute your, mute your microphones and stuff like that. Um, but I wonder if you guys wouldn't mind turning on your videos because it's really hard. Quite frankly, it's hard for me to give a talk and not see eyeballs looking back at me and not see, interaction and stuff and you know if you're in your pjs that's fine you don't have to turn on the, the video but there there is something so fundamentally incarnational about what we're talking about tonight and about discipleship and about what we're doing and so any semblance of being actually with each other i think is a good thing um so thanks for humoring me with that um i really appreciate it uh this is the first time that i've broken out a sports jacket since like february or march i'm wearing shorts underneath but you know it's it's um this is good and this is i know you guys are kind of all over the place um i'm way out in colorado um but i love the idea of seeing all of each other's faces because then it's just that much more of actually being incarnational with each other we're, we're a little bit more together so thank you for indulging me on that um all right so for tonight I want to keep things as simple as possible. And really, I, I quite frankly just wanna talk about two things. I wanna talk about the fact that discipleship is really hard, um, which should go without saying, um, but it doesn't go without saying, and I'm gonna tell you why I have a particular reason for saying that. So discipleship is really hard. That's our, con uh, our topic for tonight. Um, and it is, although it's, it can kind of be a buzzword and one of these terms that we throw out a lot and use, and there's books and video series and all sorts of different stuff about discipleship floating around in the Christian world and the Catholic world. It's a lot harder, at least in my opinion, it's a lot harder than I think we give it credit for. So discipleship is hard. That's point number one. And then point number two is that the world is not what it seems. And when I say the world is not what it seems, um, I sort of developed the talk I want to share with you guys tonight before the world lost its mind and there were pandemic, pandemics and, and, and racial outcry and all sorts of the political strife. So I don't mean those things. I mean in a much bigger eschatological, um, God is in control of all this stuff since. Um, it's so much more than meets the eye. And to the degree that we give in to the lies of the evil one and the ways in which he has manipulated so many of the things around us from our friends to our media feeds to um, you know, everything else that's going on in our world, we give in to a lie that we are called fundamentally to not give in to. So more on that in a second. So discipleship is hard. The world is not what it seems. And the way I want to do that tonight, again, pretty simple. I want to tell you two stories and a theological concept. Um, one story is about me. The other is about Jesus. Jesus is one is better, but I'll start with the me one instead. And then I want to talk about a, a concept in theology that comes from the Judaism that Jesus was raised in, that when I discovered it or when I was taught it, 
it changed everything for me. And I began to see the world through the eyes of the church, maybe for the first time. Things I actually believed, I, it clicked and a light bulb went off. So I'm gonna share that with you in just a second. Um, but a word about, uh, about discipleship before we jump into talking about it. Um, well, the two things I wanna say about it, again, I mentioned that this is um, so much harder a concept than I think at one point in my Christian life I thought it was. Because um, the first thing I have to say about discipleship is that it has, and I don't know your experience, but I've worked for the church for a long time in a lot of different capacities, and discipleship, at least in my circles, it can become a buzzword. It's a term we throw out a lot. You see it in all sorts of different ways. Um, but discipleship, and, and I point it out because this is a very difficult talk to give, because I am of the opinion that there is no program or, you know, three-step formula or, you know, bullet point thing that you can put out to understand what discipleship is because before we say anything else about it what we have to understand is discipleship was not initially a christian term it became very important in christianity and it is we use it oftentimes in reference in christianity but it's not in the beginning a christian term it was an old testament term it was a jewish term before it was a christian term and the term itself literally means a disciple is simply one who follows a teacher a follower of a teacher. And so in the ancient world, in Jesus's world, in the world that Paul grew up in, St. Paul, they, you know, if you wanted to take your faith seriously, you would find a rabbi, you would find a teacher who was influential and, and moved you and, and, you know, you were inspired by him and you would follow him. And there was a concept in Judaism that talked about being covered in the dust of your rabbi's feet. And I don't know if you've heard that before, but I love the imagery of that. And they would say, look, if you really want to show yourself to be a really good disciple, then you should be covered in the dust of your rabbi's feet, which means you're following your rabbi so closely that the dust that he kicks up by his sandals, you know, in the, in the arid Middle East heat is actually going to be covered you. And it was like the criteria for whether or not you're following your teacher closely enough. And if we understand the concept of, of discipleship, really in the most simple terms, the follower of a teacher, then this is where I think sometimes we get into our biggest stumbling block. And when we often, those of us who are in ministry, which I think is most of us, or teachers or ministers or whatever, we talk about discipleship, I think, oftentimes in reference to ourselves. And I uh, spent a number of years um, working for the ministry Focus, the Fellowship of Catholic University Students. Some of you, I'm sure, are familiar. I love Focus. I was in on the ground floor. I was one of the first missionaries. And we talk about discipleship a lot. But I, for a long time, I think, misunderstood the term. And we talk about, like, oh, I'm discipling these people which makes it sound like they're following me or I am teaching them or something like that, which is fundamentally opposed to what discipleship is. In Christian discipleship, there's only one teacher. There's only one rabbi. And so those of us who are in ministry or teaching, if someone's following you or if someone is you know, covered in the dust of your feet, then we're actually doing it wrong. And to be quite frank, most, if we're in ministry or if we're teachers, it probably means you're like me and you kind of like being in front of people. You like being listened to. You like being in front of groups. There's, you know, there's a sense it makes me kind of come alive. And it's really easy for me to forget that I'm actually not the one that's being pointed to. I'm not the one to follow. And if somebody's following me, Lord help them. I mean, that, that is the opposite of what we're trying to do, which kind of goes without saying. And I know we all kind of know that. But because it gets thrown around so much, I do think it bears repeating. Our job as ministers, our job as teachers, is to do the job of John the Baptist, which was to say, no, not me, him. It's not about me. I must decrease, he must increase. And so our whole task, which is both incredibly simple and incredibly difficult, is simply to be road signs. We are to be arrows. We are to be fingers pointing away from ourselves. And I guess that being said, the other kind of caveat I want to give, um, that was a be thank you for the, for the kind introduction. It's always, I think purgatory is going to be hearing your, your introduction read over and over again, because it's just hard and, you know, you got to kind of smile and nod. Um, but but I, I do want to say one thing. I, um, I want to throw some reflections out. I want to throw some ideas. I don't have any answers for you. Um, my only hope is that I can raise the right questions for you. And quite frankly, I mean, discipleship, discipleship is hard enough. Discipleship has taken on a whole, nother, um, a whole nother difficulty in the times that we're living in. And I don't know the degree wherever you guys are living that you can actually be with the people that you're ministering to, which is a whole nother level of difficulty. And I don't know what to do about that. 
Um, but I think there's important questions to ask. And so uh, I've, I always kind of, it's not really a joke, um, it's serious, but I always think there's a big difference between a speaker and a teacher. And I think the best speakers are teachers. And the best speakers that I know are the ones that are teachers. And the difference always to me is when I think of like a speaker, qua speaker, it's somebody who, you know, you're really excited to hear this person, you get really amped up and inspired, and you just want to hear them again and again and again. A good teacher, and again, there's lots of good speakers who are good teachers, a good teacher by definition should kind of make themselves obsolete. And I hope that you walk away from tonight and I, told, I hope you totally forget my name and completely forget who I am, but you can actually take some of the concepts and ideas and you can reproduce them. Not to say, oh, I heard this great speaker, I heard this great person who said all these great things, I don't really remember, I, I can't really do anything with him, but he was really inspiring and I wanna keep listening to this podcast or whatever, that's fine. But a teacher is only as good as the way he can make or she can make herself obsolete. And you guys can go and carry this on for yourself. So um, again, all that is to say, I just want to throw out some thoughts, some reflections, some things that hopefully you can take to your prayer life, your discussions, the groups that you minister to, because um, this is a profoundly difficult topic, quite frankly, and these are difficult times in which to do it. So, okay, the first story. First story is about me. Um, I uh, was raised here in Boulder, Colorado, which is where I am now. I'm right next door to the university, um, which is right across the street. It's pouring, pouring rain. I don't know if you can hear that. And there might be thunder at some point. So, um, but when I was in high school, I think I was a freshman in high school, little you know, 15 year old Scott. I was, I was a punk, I was shy and I was a punk wannabe skater kid. I was the worst. Um, but I remember going to be, I was invited to a youth group. I was a freshman. Um, I, was, I was a Christmas and Easter Catholic. You know, our family went to church most of the time, but it wasn't really anything that I really understood that well. It's, you know, probably a lot of the people that we minister to were in the same boat, right? It's kind of a part of our lives. It was kind of a cultural thing, but it's it just, I didn't really understand. So I found myself going to this youth group when I was a freshman in high school. And like probably 70, 75% of young men who go to a youth group in high school, I went because of a girl. Um, for no other reason than that. And so this girl invited me to go. I was kind of interested in this girl. And I was like, yeah, totally. I'll go to this youth group. And so, you know, my, I, was, I was 15. So my dad drops me off on the street corner. And I went up to this youth group. And it was, that was like 1995. So it was really hip for the time. And it was in like this fire escape kind of room. And there were, everybody had long hair and the flame. It was very grungy and um, like Nirvana-y. And every, you know, the guitars were playing. Everybody had long hair. And I walked in. And instantly, it was the absolute last place I wanted to be. And I walked in, and it was hot, and it was kind of sweaty and humid. I scanned the room, and I knew no one. The girl wasn't there. She totally, totally bait and switched. She didn't show up. I'm looking around. I don't know anybody. I didn't even know that many people at my high school to begin with. And I'm like, what do I do? And all I wanted to do was leave, but I, I couldn't drive, and I didn't really want to call my dad. And, you know, embarrassingly, like, can you pick me up? I didn't have a cell phone because they weren't invented yet. And so I was, I was stuck there. And so I was kind of scanning around. I was looking for an escape plan. I was like, maybe I can just go to a coffee shop and sit there. And then somebody spotted me, this guy named Adam. He spotted me from across the room and he had the classic youth minister eyes, which I know some of you know that look when you like you spot the kid who's like kind of wandering around aimlessly and doesn't know what to do. And he spotted me and it was like a tractor beam. And he came, he came for me. And he was like, he was moving toward me. And I was like, oh, what do I do? I don't want to talk. I'm super embarrassed. I'm shy. And he came and he started talking to me. He's like, what's up, man? My name is Adam. I've never seen you before. Where do you go to high school? You know, asking all the questions. I'm like, I'm a freshman. I go to Fairview, blah, 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 blah. You know, we had our conversation. I kind of let the youth minister game play itself out. And eventually, you know, we wandered off to other people. I went to the youth group. I didn't know the songs. They sang. There was a lot of guitars. I left. Didn't think about it again. About a year and a half later, so somewhere in my sophomore, maybe it was junior, I don't, I don't remember. I found myself in a different place in life. My world, you know, kind of got handed to me. I, I went to that same youth group for different reasons. And I found myself in need of something more than myself. I realized that I couldn't be my own God, um, which is a hard thing to realize, especially when you're in high school. So I found myself back at this youth group. Again, it's like maybe two years later. And I walked in the door and I was, you know, a little bit different by that point, but I walked in the door and almost immediately the same guy spotted me. And he came, tractor beam over to me, and he came up and he's like, hey, Scott, right? It's Adam. I'm really happy to see you again. And he was, this, he was this university student. You know, he was a mountain biker. He had long hair. I thought he was super cool, but I could not for the life of me believe that this guy, after two years, remembered my name. 
And I swear to you guys, that was probably one of the most fundamental life-changing moments of introducing me to the walk with Jesus Christ that I've had in my life. And it was as simple as some guy remembering my name, which as somebody who meets a lot of people, I have the worst time remembering names. It's such a, it's such a cross of mine. I can't do it. But there's something so powerful. There was something that, that was my introductory into discipleship. Not that it was about Adam Renfro, but it was that Adam Renfro, through the sheer act and kindness of knowing my name and knowing me, introduced me to the fact that there might be a God who wants to know me as well. And he began to point towards something greater. I marked that moment as one of the fundamentally life-changing moments of my life. And so I start with that, partially just because I think we all need reminders sometimes of how simple what we're doing can actually be. And we sometimes overcomplicate it, and it is complicated, and the faith is complicated, and the world's a complicated place, but sometimes, for Pete's sake, people just want to be known. Always, all the time, people want to be known. It is the fundamental need of humanity. We want to know and be known. And the fact that this college student, who I thought was cool, remembered this punk high school kid's name changed everything. And so I, I just begin there because it's just a good reminder. It's a good reminder for me of how simple some of this stuff can be and how we overcomplicate it um, with trying to find a program or bullet points or a step-by-step -step process in which we have to do this. Learn a name, find someone, get to know them, share your life with them, begin to give yourself and be, let yourself be known and know. So that's the first story. The other one um, is a little bit more important and it comes from the Bible. And uh, this has become, I don't know if you guys have this, maybe you will at some point in your ministry, this has become my go-to story for almost everything. And it, it's, I, there comes a point, and, and I, I don't know if you, some of you know this or have experienced this, sometimes there's that moment where you find the moment or the image or the figure in scripture that begins to inform everything else that you do. And you're like, I, I keep coming back to that story. Maybe it's the woman at the well, maybe it's, I don't know, Mary Magdalene, maybe it's um, Peter and his denial, whatever it is. Sometimes there comes that point where I, I find everything. I find so many riches that I can mine out of one story. And it becomes kind of my characteristic um, moment in the Bible. And for me, it's the story of the road to Emmaus, which some of you have probably heard it before. Maybe you've heard it a million times before. And it's been used and written about and spoken about in a million different ways. And so sometimes I even want to roll my eyes because people use this story so much. But for me, it is the embodiment of discipleship. Um, but about a year ago, I realized something in the story of the road to Emmaus that made it the emblem for discipleship that I had never noticed before. Because I thought the discipleship emblem in this story was something else. And then I ran across something or, or God enlightened me to something about a year ago. So I'm going to tell you the story. And again, maybe you know it, maybe you don't. Uh, but it's in the end of the Gospel of Luke. It's in Luke chapter 24. And I'm going to start in verse 13. It says this. It says, that very day, so this is the very end of the Gospel of Luke, and he says, that very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking with each other about all the things that had happened. Okay, so it begins by saying, that very day, which means that Luke wants you to know what very day he's talking about. And when Luke says, that very day, it doesn't take too much digging in the context to figure out the very day he's talking about is the most significant day in all of human history. It is Easter Sunday. And it's not just Easter Sunday, it's the Easter Sunday. And we are dropping into the story here at, I think, one of the most fascinating moments of all of human history. Because this is the moment that Jesus Christ has risen from the dead. He has trampled down death by death. He has defeated evil. He has conquered the grave and nobody knows about it yet. It's happened, the world has been flipped upside down, and nobody has a clue. A handful of people know that something has happened, but they're not even sure what's going on. It's a really fascinating moment in time. And so what does Jesus choose to do in the most fascinating moment of human history, but to mess with people? And it makes me love Jesus all the more that he does. So it says, uh, so there was these two disciples walking from Jerusalem, seven miles, and they were talking with each other about all the things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, and actually in Greek it says while they were arguing with each other. So they're not just chatting, they're actually having an argument with each other. So they're arguing and bickering and talking. And while this was happening, Jesus himself drew near and he went with them. He kind of sidled up next to him. 
but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. So Luke already pointed out that it's the first day of the week, which in Jewish tradition, the first day of the week is always symbolic of the first day of creation. And the first day of creation was the day that God separates light from darkness. So it's not coincidental that throughout this story, you see all these images of light and darkness and people who understand and people who are kind of kept in the dark about something. So at this moment, they're darkened. Their eyes were kept. They don't recognize him. These are people, they're disciples. They've been following Jesus for some amount of time. They've probably sacrificed something to be with him and they don't know him. They don't recognize who it is. And he said to them, it's verse 17, what are you guys talking about? Which I love that. He walks up, people are talking about him, weirdest moment in human history. He's like, what are you guys talking about? Which he, he butts into a, an argument that somebody's having and he says that. What are you guys talking about? We don't, sometimes I don't think we realize how utterly amusing the scriptures actually are and how amazing, how amusing Jesus can be. So he says, what is this conversation that you're holding with each other as you walk? What are you talking about? And they stood still looking sad. Then one of them named Cleopas answered him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? Dude, what are you talking about? Are you the only one that doesn't know what just happened in Jerusalem? Which is ironic because Jesus is literally the only person on earth who really understands what has actually happened. So again, Luke's kind of having fun with us, which I love. Um, he said to them, <laughs> and then he answers, he says to them, what things? Well, what do you mean? I don't know what you're talking about. Tell me more about this. Again, totally messing with these guys. And they said, well, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, he was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and about how our chief priests and our rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death, and they crucified him. So what do we know so far? What we know so far is that there's two disciples. They're walking away from Jerusalem, and they're bickering with each other. What else do we know? We know that one of them is named Cleophas. So the tradition has always been a little blurry about who these two are, but if you, if you kind of dig, so one of the things I love about the scriptures is that oftentimes when there's a, quest, a question that comes up in the scriptures, the answer is somewhere else in the scriptures. And so here's a question. Who are these two people? There's two people. One of them is named Cleopas, walking away from Jerusalem on Easter Sunday, disappointed. On Good Friday, John listed for you another gospel. John listed for you all the people who were at the foot of the cross on Good Friday when Jesus was crucified. And if you remember, he said there was Mary, the mother of Jesus was there. Mary Magdalene was there, John himself. And this lady called Mary the wife of Cleopas, Clopas, which was the Aramaic version of Cleopas, the Greek name. So on Friday, there's somebody named Mary, the wife of Cleopas. And then on Sunday, you got Cleopas going home with somebody. Who could the somebody be? It's probably a husband and a wife. It's probably Mary and Clopas going home, which adds this tremendous dramatic dimension to the story because of what they say next. Well, in part what they say next. Um, our chief priests, the rulers, they delivered him up to be condemned to death. They crucified him. But then in verse 21, they say, we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it's now the third day since this all happened. We had hoped. In other words, so they put it in the past tense. We used to hope. We followed him. We thought this was the guy. We had hoped. We do not hope any longer. And so what's the image you see? You see this image of a husband and a wife walking away from Jerusalem. Now, what's in Jerusalem? Well, on Easter Sunday, what's in Jerusalem are the apostles, Mary, the disciples. What the tiny little, what, what exists of the fledgling church, who are terrified and locked in a room and bickering among themselves and don't know what's going on. But in Jerusalem is the church. So the image you have here is really profound. You have a husband and a wife, a little married couple, walking away from the church, having been disappointed. A little family walking away from the church, having been let down and hurt. I mean, how many people in the world, in your families, in your life does that describe? People who have walked away from the church because they were hurt legitimately, because they were misunderstood something, because they were disappointed, it wasn't what they expected, they were sad. These two are such a, a a paradigm for our times, and I think we should look to them more. Um, and they go on, they say, yes, now it's the third day uh, since all this happened. The third day in Jewish tradition, you had to wait three days to legally pronounce someone dead. You couldn't issue a death certificate until day three, because the medical system wasn't what it is now, and maybe you misdiagnosed, or maybe they were sleeping really deeply or something. So it wasn't until the third day. So in other words, what they're saying is, he's really, really dead. 
it's been three days, they issued the death certificate, put the stamp on it, it's done, it's over, we're going home, we're done with this. And then Jesus steps in. Oh, they, they also say some women of our company amazed us. They went to the tomb early in the morning. They didn't find his body. They said they'd seen a vision of angels. I always wonder if that's what they're fighting about. Maybe Mary's like, no, maybe we should listen to the women. He's like, no, oh, that's dumb. I don't know. We don't know. We have to speculate. But then Jesus steps in and he says, verse 25, oh, fools, oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets had spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all of the scriptures the things concerning himself. Seven mile walk. It's seven miles from Jerusalem to Emmaus. How long does it take to walk seven miles? Um, I don't know, two, three, three and a half hours. I do a lot of hiking here in Colorado. A seven mile hike would take, I don't know, three hours or something like that. So imagine being with Jesus on a three hour walk where you get to ask anything and everything you've ever wanted to know. It says, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, that's the law and the prophets. That, in other words, that's the whole Bible. It says Jesus interpreted the entire Old Testament in light of himself. He gave, every, he gave the greatest homily, the best Bible study, the best seminar that anyone in history has ever given. And he had three hours to do it. I have like 30 or 40 minutes to do this. But, I mean, imagine that. And at the end of their seven mile walk, guess what state Mary and Cleopas are in? Dark, their eyes are still closed. There's something moving in them, there's something going on, but the greatest homily ever given was not enough to open their eyes. It didn't do it, it's not sufficient. A Bible study alone is not enough. So what happens? Verse 28, they drew near the village they were going and he appeared to be going further, but they constrained him. Literally in Greek it says they held onto him, they grasped him saying, stay with us. It's toward evening and the day is far spent. It's too late to go back. So he went in to stay with them. And when he was at table with them, he took the bread, blessed it and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him. If you didn't notice, this is actually where the church gets the formula for the mass. Think about it. The scriptures were proclaimed. There was a homily, an explanation of the scriptures. And then they go and sit at the Eucharistic table again. And it's when, and the formula that Luke uses for what happens at the table are the exact same words he used to describe the Last Supper. He took bread, blessed bread, broke, get bread, and gave it. Took, blessed, took, blessed, broke, and gave. It's Luke's Eucharistic formula. So what happens is they receive the Eucharist, and then all of a sudden, everything else makes sense. And he vanished out of their sight, I think, because now he's sacramentally present with them, and everything has changed. And it's at that moment that they said, we got to go back. We got to tell everybody about this. So many things going on here. If we accept this as being perhaps a man and a woman, a husband and a wife, really what we're dealing with is the very end of the Bible. This is the end of the story. You have Paul's letters, which are basically commentary on everything that's happened. But we're getting toward the end of the narrative. And at the end of the narrative, what do you have? You have a husband and a wife who eat something and their eyes are opened. Does anyone remember the first people in the Bible who eat something? Yeah, it's Adam and Eve, remember? I love, thank you for turning on your cameras. This is so much better than staring at my own face or something or at blank screens. Adam and Eve, what happens at the very beginning of the Bible? A husband and a wife eat something. And what happens? Their eyes are opened. To what? To death, corruption, to chaos, to sin, to evil, to fear. Literally, at the other end of the story, you have another husband and a wife who eat something and their eyes are opened. What? To forgiveness, to reconciliation, to new life, to resurrection, to fearlessness. The story is completed. It's brought full circle. And what do they eat? They eat, as the fathers of the church say, the thing that hung on the tree, which is precisely what Adam and Eve ate. Different tree. But Jesus, if he is the Eucharist, he is a fruit that hangs from a tree which they eat, which begins to unravel the whole human problem that the scriptures began with, which is really cool. And I've loved this story and I love kind of extrapolating all these things, but here's the thing about a year ago that I noticed that I never did. I thought this was a great example of discipleship because you know they have this explanation, they go to mass, and then they're so excited they run back and they have to tell everybody. And I've always thought that one of the fundamental aspects of, of discipleship is 
if we've experienced Jesus in a real way, we should have no choice but to have to tell everybody which is these people's response, which is right and holy and good. But here's what I never thought about, and take it for whatever you will. Jesus spends the most important day in human history taking a seven-mile hike with these two guys, with these two folks. I was about to call them a name. But these two folks that we literally don't know anything else about. We have some guesses, but we don't know anything else about these guys. Jesus decided on the most important day in all of human history to say, I'm going to go take a three and a half hour walk with those two and mess with them. Think, I mean, think about that. Now, I know he's doing a lot of other things on Easter Sunday, and I'm not sure how he's in multiple places at once. But the point remains, he chose to spend that moment of the most important day in all of human history, messing with these two people and walking with them for I don't know, three and a half hours, and then having dinner with them. So we're talking about like five hours? I mean, imagine that. And the reason I share that with you, and the reason that became so profound and convicting to me, and really what it did was become convicting, because I realized, and I looked back over my time in ministry, I thought about my life as a focus missionary. Back when I was in focus, um, focus, it does university ministry on, on campuses, and it's like peer mentorship and discipleship and lead Bible studies and stuff. But I remember when I was a Focus missionary, um, I was at this new campus up in Montana that Focus had never been. And I, my parents weren't a big fan of what I was doing with my life. And they're like, when are you going to get a real job? And, you know, there was all these things around it. My friends were all getting real jobs. And I was drinking coffee and playing basketball with college students. Literally, that's what I did after I graduated, which was a great gig. But I was so desperate. I remember that first, actually, all my years in Focus, if I'm honest with myself. I remember being so desperate to make myself look busier than I was because I couldn't bear for students to think, dude, this guy is just got nothing to do except sit around and wait for me to have a cup of coffee with me. And so I would bring notebooks and I would write nothing. I would walk around, I swear to you, I would walk around campus and I would find people to pretend to point to and wave to. So it looked like I knew more people than I did which was a trick I picked up from Scott Hahn, who actually did the same thing when he did uh, high school ministry. He would go to football games and just pick blank spots out in the the bleachers and be like, hey, what's up, man? Because I couldn't bear for people to think, dude, this guy has nothing to do. And I remember I was actually um, talking with the focus team here at the University of Colorado. I I do a Bible study with them every week. And we were talking about this concept and and, um, I was talking about how afraid I was of, of making it seem like I just didn't have anything to do. And somebody actually said, they're like, but Scott, like, we don't really want this. Do we want the students to just think all we do is sit around and wait for them to get out of class so we can hang out? And I said, yeah, that's kind of what you do. I mean, I know you have other things and you, you raise funds and you have, you know, benefactors that you move to, but really isn't your job sitting around and waiting for college students to get out of class so you can go have a cup of coffee with them and tell them about Jesus Christ? Isn't that your gig? And I think about, even, even now, I spend so much time being terrified that people will think I'm not busy. And maybe it's because I'm worried about my job or my status or, you know, other people at the university. And, you know, he just sits around and, and talks to people about Jesus. And I'm so afraid of people thinking, I, COVID has changed everything. And maybe this pandemic has been kind of a blessing in that sense, because, um, I think that busyness has become a status symbol. And I even see this with my neighbors and stuff. And, and I'll have discussions. I, I like and I'm close with my neighbors, but, you know, we'll almost try to one-up each other. You know, I'll get home from work and be like, oh, my gosh, i got to take Samuel to soccer practice. And then Lily's got to get to gymnastics. And I've got this other thing to do. And then I've got a work thing. And I am so busy, right? And we do this all the time. We're like, oh, my gosh, you think that's busy. I've got all this stuff to do. And I got that exam. And I have this thing for work. We always, at least I do, and the people that I know, we always try to one-up each other about how busy we are. Because somehow I think it makes us feel more important than we should be. And the busier we are, the more stuff we have crammed into our calendars, the better we are at whatever it is we do. And then I think about Jesus, who said, yeah, on the most important day of human history, I'm going to take five hours to go and hike with those guys. Which, that, that kind of rocked me. And that's the one that shook me. And that's the one that made me start asking myself, wow, 
what am I willing in my life to drop or to give up to be totally available to the people in my life that God might be calling me to go on a seven mile hike with or have a cup of coffee with or sit down and talk on the phone or have a Zoom, you know, cocktail hour with or whatever it is that I just feel so way too busy to deal with. Because don't you know how busy I am? Don't you know how much I have to do? Don't you know how many students are in my youth group and how many calls I have to make? Don't you realize how much I've got? And then you got Jesus who's like, yeah, I've got a world to save, but I'm going to spend five hours with those two. And then I get moved. I, one last story on, on that. And I, I, um, I keep talking about focus. I originally gave a version of this talk at the big national focus conference. So it's kind of focus heavy. Um, but uh, I, I, I assume some of you are familiar with focus. Maybe some of you have been to like the big seek conferences, which are like these, these conferences of college students that are like, I don't know, like 20,000 people. They're, they're, really, they're really beautiful, really cool. But a friend of mine, I was at one years ago. And again, culture of busyness, right? I was at this conference and um, all three of my children, this is a side note, all three of my children came to our family through adoption. And it's a tremendous blessing in our life, but it's a, it's a, there's a lot of baggage with that. But I was at one of these huge focus conferences and my buddy, Steve, Steve Priest, who's a big wig in focus now, Steve Priest was literally in charge of the whole conference. And, and you've seen people like this. He had like the huge headset on and he had like a couple different earbuds and he had like three microphone or uh, walkie talkie strap. He was riding a Segway which was, I just wanted to make fun of so much. And he was, he was like the important guy at the conference. And you know, there's like thousands of people. And I got a call, I was in Baltimore, and I got a call from my wife and she's like, Scott, we have this opportunity to adopt this child. He's gonna be born in like a week and a half. What do you think? This, this birth mom is kind of in a desperate situation. We're open to adoption. What do you think, should we do it? And I was like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> like I gotta decide like right now, I'm in a hotel room by myself in Baltimore. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is too much. So my friend Steve, I was like, Steve is adopted. We share that with each other and, and he's my brother in Christ. And so Steve was about to go into the massive ballroom full of like thousands of people and he had all of his headsets on. And I walked up to Steve and I was like, Steve, I know you're super busy. I'd love to catch up later on. We got this call about an adoption. I'm super freaked out. Can you say a prayer and maybe we can catch up whenever you have time? And he looked at me and he looked at whoever his like number two was. He took his headset off. He handed it to her. He was literally about to go on stage and introduce like Scott Hahn or Matt Maher, something big. He handed his, his headset to her. And he's like, can you handle this next session? And I was like, Steve, you're literally running the conference. He's like, if I don't have time to go and pray with you right now, what's the point of anything else we're doing? He's like, let's go pray. And then I'll buy you a drink and we can talk about this. And it was such a moving moment because if it were me, if I'm honest with myself, I'm like, that, that's so cool. I'll pray for you. Maybe we can catch up later, but I've got so much to do right now. I am in charge. I'm doing all these things. But the humility to say, no, somebody else can handle this. If I don't have time to drop this other stuff to pray with my brother in Christ, who is in kind of a immediate crisis, why are we doing any of this stuff? And I guess my challenge to you guys is, what are the things in your life that you're willing to drop so that you can be the John the Baptist to someone else and say, let me tell you about who I followed. Let me tell you about the crazy road that my rabbi has walked on that I've had to follow him on. Um, last thing I wanna say, I don't know, I don't, I, I, we're probably almost out of time. So here's the last thing. I said two stories and a theological concept. I'll give you the concept as quickly as I can um, because it applies to everything else. And I discovered this years ago when I was taught, taught, uh, taught this concept by a teacher of mine. Um, and it's a concept that once I went back and began to unpack, this concept is so prevalent throughout the entire New Testament. Jesus talks about it, St. Paul talks about it, John talks about it, everybody talks about it. And all of Christianity has no clue about it. We've never heard of this. And so I'll introduce it to you. It's a concept called the two ages, the two ages. Maybe some of you have heard this, but basically it went like this. In the Judaism that Jesus grew up in, in first century Judaism, second temple Judaism is the technical term, there was a concept called the two ages. And basically, the world that formed Jesus looked at the world in, two, in, in terms of two epochs and time, time periods. And they went back to the story of original sin. And they said, when Adam and Eve sinned, when they broke trust with God, when they disobeyed the God who loved them, sometimes we call it original sin, but sometimes we call it the fall, right? Which is very kind of visceral. So they said, when human beings fell, 
it's like we fell from the state of being that we were supposed to exist in when our souls were united to our wills and our minds were united to our emotions and all the stuff that St. Thomas Aquinas talks about, right? All of, we were in unity with ourselves. We were the people we were called to be and then we took a fall and everything got broken and we were prone to sin and then there was war and strife and disaster and everything else. So that ushered in, so say the ancient Jews, the present age, the present age. Sometimes they called it the old age. And the old age ushered in by Adam and Eve was defined by sin and death and chaos and strife and fear and sin and evil, right? It's, the, it's, it's what St. Paul is continually talking about when he talks about what Adam and Eve did to the world. They brought in fear and death and chaos and sin. But they believed, the ancient Jewish people believed that there would come a time when God would step into human history and set everything right. And he would fix it. And he would usher in what they called the age to come. Or sometimes they called it the new age, but that's got other meanings for us. So they called it the age to come. Um, and you see Jesus and Paul talking about the rulers of this age do da 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 But in the age that is to come, it will be like this. They use this terminology all the time because everybody knew it. Everybody talked this way. Oh, well, it, things stink now. But in the age to come, when God steps in and fixes everything, then it's going to be amazing and beautiful and wonderful. And you can see this all through the Bible. So my question to you is, in 2020, in July of 2020, which age do we live in? Are we in the old age of sin and death and corruption and chaos? Or are we in the age that is to come in which God has vindicated everything, when he is, he is, death is no more and sin is obliterated and every tear has been wiped away from every eye and everything has been set right? Which age do you and I live in? So show of hands, who thinks we live in the old age or the present age of sin and death and chaos? All right, cool, cool. Who thinks we live in the age that is to come where God has set everything right? Who thinks it's secret answer number C? It's secret answer C, of course. No, but here's the thing. Here's what no one saw coming. And people have written books about this. Everyone sort of assumed that, yeah, the world is terrible. There's sin everywhere, death, chaos, war. God's going to come in and it's going to kind of be instantaneous, right? The day will come. God will step in. Everything will be fixed. Everything, you know, the good guys will go that way. The bad guys will be sent away that way. Sheep and the goats, you know, all that stuff. It was all going to happen instantaneously. No one understood that there would be an overlap of the ages, that there would be an in-between. And what the Christian tradition has taught us is that we live smack dab in the middle. We live in the turning of the ages where sin really has been forgiven. Death really has been trampled down because Jesus rose from the dead. That's the proof. Evil really has been vanquished. However, I still sin and I'm still afraid of death. And there seems like there's still evil everywhere and hatred and anger and vitriol and sin is rampant. And so the task of almost the entirety of the New Testament, Paul's whole message, I think, is trying to convince his li listeners that the world is not what it seems like it is. The world is not as it seems. And all of your senses are lying to you. So when you wake up every morning and you're afraid of death and your own sin and all of the evil, and we ask the question, guys, we are Christians. And how many people do you know? And how many times have you yourself wondered, man, I wonder if good or evil is going to prevail in the end. I mean, think about seriously, sit on that for a second. How many times do we consciously or subconsciously, along with the rest of Christianity, think, man, I don't really know if good or evil is going to win. We're kind of waiting. It's like we don't know the end of the story. It's like we don't know how this movie ends. Guys, we know how the movie ends. Jesus won. Death is defeated. Evil has been conquered, but we live in the moment. I, I like the analogy. I've heard this analogy where um, when World War II was won, so there was a, a gap between D-Day, which was when World War II was, was won and the Nazis were defeated and concentration camps were beginning to come to an end, and what was called VE Day, which was the time that everyone actually was emancipated. And in the time between D-Day, the time that World War II ended, and VE Day, when everyone was emancipated, there was absolute chaos. I mean, so when people who ran the concentration camps got word that the Axis powers had lost and that the Nazis were defeated, do you think they were all like, well, I guess we'll throw, it was a good run, boys, let's throw in the towel, we'll head home. 
thanks for everything, guys. You know, no, they tried to re wreak as much chaos and death and destruction as possible. We lost. So in our last, last gasp, we're going to destroy as much as we can. That is where we live as Christians right now. That is what's happening spiritually in 2020. Satan has lost. The battle has been defeated. And until Jesus Christ comes again and the veil is lifted and we see the age to come as it is, Satan's going to try to cause as much chaos as possible. But here's the good news. And here's what St. Paul sort of tells us. The only power that Satan has in this in-between period is to lie to you. It's the only authority he has to whisper in your ear, you're not good enough, you're, you stink, you're ugly, you're powerless, you're awful, you will never get out of your sin, you should be afraid of everything, you will always be a slave to these things, or to tell you about your neighbor. That person's horrible, that person stinks. Can you believe how evil they are? Think of that mindset there. What, what a horrible human being. What, look at the sin of that person. He whispers these things in our ears all the time. And our job as Christians is to reject it as a lie because it's the only authority he has, you guys. It's all he's got is to whisper lies into your ears and to the degree we're like, yeah, no, it's true. I am. I do stink. I am ugly. I am powerless. I'm never going to find a spouse. I'm always going to be, you know, fearful. My parents are never going to, you know, be proud of me. That person really is horrible. Those, that political group over there, I really hate them. They're sheer evil. Yeah, totally. We believe this stuff all the time, right? But the question is, if we really do live in the age that is to come, which we do, what would we be willing to give up? What would we be willing to drop everything that we would drop on the ground for the sake of showing someone the way to Jesus Christ? I, I think about the, the tiny whatever it was that Adam Renfro dropped to come and introduce himself to a punk high school kid named Scott. He didn't give up much, but he gave up a little bit. And maybe he was afraid. Maybe I, maybe I don't give enough credit to the nervousness that he actually had inside. And said, so I'm going to introduce myself to that kid. He looks super shy. I don't know if I want to, but yeah, let's give it a shot. I'm going to introduce myself. I'm going to say hi. And he didn't know that he changed the course of someone's life in doing that. What are you willing to drop, you guys? What are you willing to give up because you know that the world is not what it seems and there's nothing to lose? There's nothing to fear. And this, this, um, uh, culture of busyness, this um, dictatorship of busyness does not have control over you. You don't have to be afraid of everything like I am prone to being. And lest I leave you with this not making sense, I'll give you one last uh, image. It's not an analogy. Every time we go to Mass, and maybe some of you haven't been to Mass for a while, I don't know what it's like where you are, but every time you go to Mass, what you see is a man standing on an altar holding up what looks, smells, tastes, feels, sounds, every sense, like bread. And a cup that looks and tastes and smells and feels and sounds like wine. But what the church is telling you is to say, hey, I need you to suspend belief in every one of your senses, because that's not what it is. And all of your senses are actually lying to you in that moment because that's not bread or wine anymore. That is the body and blood, soul and divinity of the God who is currently holding you in existence along with everybody else at all moments in all time. And when we go up to receive, we say in Hebrew, hamin, amen, which literally means, yes, I believe that. And so if you've never been conscious of saying, basically, yes, Father, I believe that all of my senses are lying to me and I'm going to suspend belief in all of them for a moment to receive on my tongue, the God that holds me in existence at all times, along with everything else in the world. Yeah, I can handle that. And if you can wrap your brain around suspending all of the belief in your senses, for that case, what the church is asking you to do is suspend the belief in all of your senses for the rest of it as well. The world is not shrouded in evil. Death does not have the victory. Evil is not in control, and Satan is not the king over this world. As much as the news tells you it is, as much as social media tells you it is, as much as every single thing out there tells you that it is, it's a lie. And the question is, if we live in the age that is to come, just with a veil over our eyes, how much are you willing to risk for the belief that that's actually true? Because if you do that, then discipleship can start. And then you can say, hey, listen to how I view the world. Here's why I'm not afraid. Here's why I don't hate all those people over there. Here's why I can actually wake up in the morning not 
paralyzed by fear of everything, which you guys, most of our world can't get out of bed without being paralyzed by fear, which comes out as anger or bullying or whatever it else it is that our world is doing. And so if the one group of people who are supposed to have hope that the world is not what it seems, do not actually act as though that's the case, then a hopeless world doesn't stand a chance, which means it's on us, which means take the headset off and find who it is that God wants you to take the, the quote unquote seven mile hike with or the long coffee date with or the Zoom call with or whatever it is, because that's what discipleship is. So um, that's all I got, you guys. Let's close in a quick prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. All glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks, you guys. I really Dr. appreciate Powell, it. Wow. Thank you so much for that incredible presentation on this topic, and for the reflections that you share that I know. They resonate with many of us, many of us that are working in this ministry. I think uh, uh, th those definitely spoke to us. So if you're open to it, I know we're already kind of at the hour mark, but if you're open to it, I'd like to take some time for some um, Q&A to see if anybody has any questions. Uh, maybe we can take two or three questions, and then if there's too many, uh, then maybe I can follow up with you, um, and we can try to get answers for people after the fact. Totally. Absolutely. Whatever works. All right. So in order to do the question and answer, if you were here for the session one last month, we're going to do it the same way. There are two ways that you can ask a question. Either you can raise your hand. And by doing that virtu virtually in the participants panel and the chat panel, there's a raise hand, a blue raise hand icon. Um, otherwise, you can type your question out in the chat and I'll read it out loud. If you raise your hand, I'll call on you and then you can ask your question directly to Dr. Powell. So if there are any questions, go ahead and do that. Um, while we wait for people to submit those, I'm going to kick us off with one question. Um, in the beginning of your presentation, you use the analogy of getting lost in the dust that gets kicked up by the rabbi's feet. Yeah. And there's a sense of relationship there between us and the rabbi. What are some practical ways that as youth and young adult ministers, some disciplines we can start building into our you know, everyday lives in order to, to build upon that and kind of get blinded by that dust so that we can go on and, and do the work that we're being called to do? Um, and part of what I, I, I actually forgot to mention at the beginning was the reason I, so I mentioned discipleship is so difficult, which again, there's lots of reasons for that. I think part of the reason it's so difficult is that if discipleship is simply following a teacher and getting lost sort of in the dust of his feet, we have a really crazy teacher that is taking so many twists and turns and going to play, you know, uphills, down valleys and places that we don't always know if we want to follow him, which is why it's hard to think of a programmatic way to talk about discipleship because he's going to lead me into all sorts of weird places that he's not going to lead you. And he leads, you know, my pastor and the places that he doesn't lead your, you know, all these things, but, but he's nuts. He's a little bit crazy. And I think we have a God who's actually okay with that, but I don't know. So what we have to, what we have to do then is, is change. I think the conversation from, okay, so how do we learn how to be dis it's the question of how do, we, how do we learn to ask Jesus where he is? And how do we learn to ask where he is moving? Because I think sometimes we get, I'm speaking to myself, I guess, sometimes I get so lost in the concept and the bigness of discipleship and all of the, the precepts of the church, which are so crucial to everything to go along with that. We don't ask the very, at least I don't, ask the very simple question, Jesus, where are you today? When I get out of bed, and when, when our, our students and when the people we work with get out of bed, I think we need to teach them to say, the, to ask Jesus the question, where are you today? Where are you asking me to go today? What, you know, where, where to today? Which is the only way that discipleship works is when we ask Jesus where he is. Because discipleship, the other thing we know about discipleship throughout the Bible, especially the gospel of Mark, that's like the discipleship gospel. Discipleship always begins with a call. And what that tells me is that Jesus is never going to call us to, Jesus is never going to have us follow him to a place that he doesn't tell us where he is. He, he tends to hide himself and kind of, he can be shrouded, but I don't think we have a God who, who wants to be hidden from us. I think we have a God who calls to us, but I think we have a culture that is so busy and so loud that we don't have the ears and the quietness, the silence. We, don't, we haven't trained ourselves in the silence to actually hear his voice. At, at Camp Oitiwa, when we do our outdoor program, which had to be canceled for the summer, but when we do our outdoor program, we do this, this game, we do this huge scavenger hunt on the last day all around camp, and it's called Quest. 
but one of the last tasks is that they have to go through, the students, the high school students, have to go through this, um, this crazy obstacle course and they're blindfolded so they can't see where they're going. And they have a partner who's on their team who's instructing them on where to go. But the problem is there's six other teams who also have people shouting at their teammate as to where to go. And so we use this as this metaphor after the exercise as to how do you pick out the voice of the person who's directing you when there's so many other voices that are being shouted? And it's a very you know, concrete example. And kids usually say, you know, and I usually ask the question, do you think you would have recognized their voice yelling at you to jump over the thing or to climb under the table or whatever it is on the first day of camp in the same way that you do today on the seventh day of camp? And they're like, no, of course not. And I say, why not? And they say, well, because we've spent time with the person. I've talked to them. I know what their voice sounds like because we hung out together. And it raises the question like, well, how can we hear God's voice unless you actually spend the time to hang out with God and listen to him? Which sounds so simple, but how much of our spiritual life is spent, you know, reciting something or going, reading something. We spend, and I, reciting things and reading things are the best. I love I, books, books galore. But how much time do we spend talking or thinking about Jesus rather than actually talking to Jesus? We spend, at least I do, I read, I have books on my night shelf, I have books behind me, tons of stuff about Jesus. But I spend such embarrassingly little time actually talking to Jesus. And if I don't actually do that, and then on the flip side, shut up and listen, I'm never going to hear the voice every morning that says, okay, here's where we're going today. Here's what's up today. Here's, and, and that's going to be, you know, this person shows up in your life who needs the seven mile hike or needs the cup of coffee. But again, we can drown those voices out. Um, and the only way to actually hear them is, ask, is to learn to ask the question, but also learn to put yourself in the silence to actually hear the response. And then we can be able to sift through all the noise of everything else because we've spent time with the God whose voice we know. But it's really hard to do. So I don't know if that answer makes sense or not. No, that was great. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to turn to Raymond. Raymond, do you have a question? Uh, yes, I do, Scott. Um, in the spirit of that exercise you had mentioned, what would you say or how would you direct a, an impressionable teenager who's coming first, first time, and he comes at you with two notions, blind faith versus faith, seeking understanding how would you go about explaining that so is this person is this person in question coming in with the assumption that hey what you guys believe is you just got to blindly have faith because I, I do think that's such a common perception of that was my perception of the church for pete's sake i was like well i want to i want to think i want to you know we have such i mean the tradition of i i um okay I think if I'm understanding the question correctly, I would, I would ask the young person for an example. So what's an example of something that you think the church is asking you to have blind faith about? Because we, I get paralyzed when I think in terms of generalities or this big thing or the idea that, you know, the church asks us to believe all of this crazy stuff. And so many times we're like, well, what, what specifically are you thinking? Give me an example. And oftentimes that example, either the person actually doesn't have an example, they're like, well, I don't really have anything specifically. It's just kind of a general um, stereotype that I have. Or they raise something that, I mean, it's amazing the amount of stuff the church has actually thought through to say, oh, no, here's why this actually fits. I love, I, I'm at the University of Colorado, this huge, massive, scientifically based research university. And I love pointing out to people that in the church's story of creation, there's room for something like the Big Bang. And there's room for all these elements of astrophysics and all the scientists who have come through the church and helped define what the church does believe and what she doesn't believe and where there's room in the middle for saying, no, there's all sorts of possibilities. And that students are always amazed. They're like, wait a second. A priest came up with the Big Bang theory, first of all. And the church has actually thought about that stuff that there's room for science and faith because there's this terrible stereotype that somehow science, for example, or just reason in general, are pit against faith or pit against um, you know, the church and, and theology, which for so long we have this tradition in the church where 
theology and universities and theology and philosophy were actually united together. And we don't do that so well anymore. We have this, this great tradition from so much of our past, but we've allowed ourselves to kind of succumb to the stereotype sometimes. So I'm always amazed um, when I kind of drill down on people who have questions like that, either they don't actually really have a question, it's just sort of a generic stereotype, or it's this thing, I'm really struggling with this thing, and the church has already thought through that thing. And it's, um, I, I'm also never afraid, I, I, sometimes I am, but I try never to be afraid of saying, I actually don't know the answer to that. I'm not sure why the church teaches that, but, but give me some time, let me go see if I can find some books or resources, and let me come back with you an, with an answer, because the church really does love the life of the mind and love reasonability of faith. So I bet there's an answer. So let me go dig for it and let's have a conversation afterwards. Never be afraid of saying, I don't know, but let me go try to find out, um, which is, it can be paralyzing sometimes. I don't know, that, that's some thoughts that I have. I think that's, um, it's a question I see all the time in, in some form or another. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Hoff. Uh, we have time for one more question that, and it was sent uh, to the group chat or to the chat here to me. It reads, can you talk on discipleship and embracing our cross? In your own experience, how does this go hand in hand, especially in leadership and living out our discipleship? Can you read it one more time? Sure. Can you talk on discipleship and embracing our cross? In your own experience, how does this go hand in hand, especially in leadership and living out our discipleship? <laughs> um, I'm hesitant to get too personal. Um, but I, it's a, it's a fairly personal question. I know I, not in a bad sense, but it, it's, it's hard. You can't talk about this. This is the other thing that's hard about teaching discipleship is that you can't not get personal about it because discipleship, if it's really just me following Jesus, where he has led me, you can't not get personal about that. And I've, um, I know it, it's the joke. Everybody's like, this has been the hard, it's, it's been a really hard year. Um, it's been a weirdly hard, everybody's had a hard year. It's not a competition, but, um, I started this year dealing with a, a, a fake, well, um, a fake scandal that was, there was some accusations of some people at our own church. I had to take point in doing all the PR for it. There was this media thing. There was a, a scandal that didn't really exist, um, that I was dealing with back in September into January. January came around, it was a new year. I went to this big focus conference. I came back um, to find my, my brother dead in his apartment. Um, so I held my dead brother's body and helped him be put into a body bag. And then, you know, about a couple weeks after that, the world lost its mind and COVID happened and the pandemic and everything shut down and everything else. It's just, it, it's, um, why do I share all that? I'm not trying to, to give you a misery story. I guess I share it because, um, it's been one of those years or a series of months, especially with my brother. And my brother's death was coming off of kind of a disillusionment of stuff in the church just because there was some hurt and there was some ecclesial hurt. And not, there wasn't scandal in the sense of, of deep sin, but just it's a mess. And if you work for the church for any period of time, you're going to realize that it's a mess. And there's politics and people are not as always what they appear. And so I was already kind of wrecked from that. And then my brother died. And I'm like, God, what are you doing? What, what the heck, man? This is horrible. And I, I, it was one of those moments, and there's been others, but there's these moments in your life where there, you can talk about, I, I feel like I understood the virtue of hope in a different way, because I, we talk about hope as a virtue, and I think of it in the theological sense. But there was days where I'm like, man, I sure hope this is all true. And I'm going to get out of bed, and I'm going to go to work, and I'm going to do my job, and I'm going to minister to people as best that I possibly can but I sure hope this is real. And I hope you're there, God, because I don't feel you. I don't see you. I don't hear you. I don't feel any support from anything else around me. I'm sick over my brother's death and this whole other thing. And I, I, I realize when, we, when I talk about hope, you know, I talk about it in this generic theological sense, but then there was really the days that I was like, I sure hope it's true. <laughs> and I realized that there's actually virtue to that. And maybe that's what the virtue actually is, to come to the point where you're like, man, I, I hope so, which is not disbelief. I mean, there's still faith. Um, and I, I sort of realized that that's what God was calling. That was my weird moment of following the crazy rabbi at that moment was, all right, Scott, just get out of bed. Just get out of bed and keep saying, yeah, I hope this is real. I hope it's true. I hope I'm doing my job correctly. 
I hope I'm not speaking anything that's going to lead anyone away from you. I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope I'm being a decent father. I hope I'm doing, you know, what you're calling me to do. I am trying desperately to follow you. But the other thing is the closer you get to following Jesus, if you really are covered in the dust of his feet, it gets really hard to see. And there's this weird paradigm in the faith, and I'm not saying this is where I was, but there's this weird paradigm in the faith, and the ancients talk about centuries of Avila, my daughter's namesake, talks about how sometimes the closer you get to God and the closer you get to conforming yourself to his will, the less he can be seen. It gets darker. It's almost like staring into a light bulb, right? If you look straight into a light bulb and you look away, everything else is dark and blurry. It's kind of the same concept with the, the, rabbi, the dust of the rabbi's feet. The closer you get to the rabbi, sometimes you can't see him very well. And sometimes it's all you can do to try to spot the heel of the sandal as it's, you know, a couple of feet in front of you. And you're like, there it is. There it is. Okay. Oh, there's dusty again. And there's dirt and I'm coughing and there's all the stuff in my mouth. Okay. There's the heel. It's over there now. But, but that's, I think, to acknowledge that that's so much of the faith, right? I can see his heel. I think I'm going to go that way. And to trust that he's not going to leave you behind. He's not going to not come back for you. But sometimes it's all you can do to try to spot a glimmer of whatever you can of your rabbi and say, okay, I'll go that way. Because I sure hope that's him. I sure hope that's the way he went. Um, but that's a very, it's a much more human concept of hope than I think I thought hope was. It's not this abstract theological concept. It's saying, I hope that's you, Jesus. And I'm going to trust that it is. And I'm going to keep moving, trusting that if it's not you, you're going to stop me because you know my heart and you know I love you. And I'm not seeking after something intentionally that's false. So please, if I'm not going the right way, I hope you stop me. And I hope that's you, and I'm gonna keep going. But I mean, that's, that's the life of faith. That's the life of working for the church for Pete's sake. I mean, that's, the, that's just life right now. I'm gonna drag myself out of bed and I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to find the corner of your heel. And I'm gonna go. Um, I think you can't do this. And then I'll combine it lastly with, um, the words that Jesus says in the road to Emmaus story, which we didn't have time to really talk about, but when he's talking to them, when, when he's explaining to these two people the scriptures and unpacking and unlocking all that is about him, because the whole story of the Old Testament is about Jesus, and the whole of Jesus is hidden in the Old Testament. But when he, when he says to them, he, and they're complaining and they're sad about the fact that he had to die, he says, was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory, which is a line that haunts me and has haunted me for a long time. Was it not necessary? Which sometimes I think we believe in this faith. We believe in a God of silver linings sometimes where we say, oh, everything's terrible and my life is really hard and all these things are difficult, but maybe God will bring some good out of it. Maybe there's a silver lining in there somewhere, which I think is such absolute baloney. Because if all we believe in is a God of silver linings or a God who's maybe going to scrape some good out of this terrible situation, then that's not the God of the Christian faith. The God of the Christian faith is Jesus who says, was it not necessary that I suffered all these things to enter into my glory? And I hope that I'm going to stand before God someday. I hope, I hope, I hope. And it, he will say, Scott, you know, my, my children all came to us through adoption. I mentioned that. One of my kids, my middle, my middle kid, my son, um, has a lot of uh, special needs because of some very severe trauma that he endured while he was in the womb because his birth mom had the snot beat out of her by a guy that was in her life who has a very special place um, in, I don't, I don't have a category for that exactly, but um, he was, her, his birth mom was, was beaten badly up to nine months in her pregnancy. And my son is going to have to carry some of the ramifications of this person's sin for the rest of his life. And so I hope that if I get to stand before God someday, he won't say, well, that was terrible, but look, I brought some good out of it. You know, it was, there's, there's some silver lining here. I hope that I have a God who will say, Scott, was it not necessary that Samuel, your son, suffer these things so that I could make him into the saint that he is called to be? Was it not necessary that you and Annie suffered these things as parents that were so out of your control so that I could make you into the parents that I wanted you to be? Was it not necessary? And that's where the cross doesn't just become an add-on or something that, oh yeah, that's gonna happen too. And that's kind of an aside. That is the gig. And if it's not the gig, I, I don't, I don't wanna believe in a God that's just gonna show up at the last minute and try to bring something nice and put a bow on it. I wanna be, believe in a God who at all times and all moments 
is saying, no, I'm here, I'm in charge of this. Even if you can't see me, I am working through it and I'm going to bring such glories out of it that you can't even imagine. Your son suffered profound injustice and abuse. I'm going to bring so much glory out of that hardship that you won't even believe it. That's a God that sometimes we're not willing to trust in the bigness of. Because sometimes that's a little too big for us to handle. Can you bring good out of this situation? Can you bring good out of the politics in our country? Can you bring good out of you know, the racial stuff or the riots or whatever else? Can you? Because then we just cower in fear and we start to hate and we start to bully. Oh, I hate that group of people. I can't believe that group of people. These people are blah, blah, blah. Or do we say, no, God, you have glory that's hidden in this that I can't see. And just like I can say amen when I receive the Eucharist, I can say amen when I see this because I know that you've got something behind it. And I know that you haven't left us out in the cold and that you are going to bring your glory out of even this situation. So you can't, it's, it doesn't work without that, I think. And that's why we lose people in ministry and we burn out in ministry and we just get exhausted and disheartened and we become like the couple on the road to Emmaus who say, yeah, I had really high hopes when I went into ministry. I was really excited about working for the church, but now I'm walking away disappointed because I didn't expect the cross. And not only do we not expect the cross, but we can't see beyond the cross and see what God is doing through the cross. And so if we can give our young people nothing else or each other nothing else, it's to try to have the ability of, no, don't forget, Jesus said, was it not necessary? And I trust and I hope he's going to say that to you about this thing as well. I know he will because that's who we believe in. That's the only antidote that we have, I think. Wow. Well, um, Dr. Powell, I think the only words that could uh, properly articulate our appreciation for you and for this presentation today are, are thank you. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for being so open and, and willing to get personal with your experience and for showing us what a true example of discipleship is. So um, we appreciate you and, and we thank you for taking the time today. Thank you all so much for having me. It's really been a huge honor. And thank you for letting me see your faces. It feels like we're <laughs> together a little bit. Thank you for that. It means a lot to me. Thing. So before we close, we just have a couple closing um, announcements. So I'm just going to go ahead and share the screen here. Let's get this slide up here. Christian? Yes, Aidan, go ahead. Gregory, before you do that, Scott, are you still with us? I am, Your Excellency. Scott, I have a confession. I hate talks. <laughs> I, I hate talks. But this was one of the finest teachings that I, as a bishop, in 64 years have had the privilege of witnessing. I thank you so much for sharing. So it was personal, it was helpful, and it was something that we could take some great hope and great lessons for. So thank you so much. Thank you, Your Excellency. A lot. Yeah, I appreciate it very much. And thanks, Christian. Thank you. All right. So in closing, as I said in the beginning, um, so this webinar series is being hosted by the Office for Maronite Youth and Young Adults and um, social media pages have been set up for the office to keep up to date with the different initiatives that we're working on, different resources that we'll be putting out, etc. So we invite you and we ask you to make sure that you like the Facebook page and follow us on Instagram. You'll be seeing a lot more posts, a lot more initiatives um, going live very soon. Also, um, many of you should know, and if you don't, this is kind of your public service announcement. Uh, for the Eparchy of St. Marin of Brooklyn, we have partnered with Franciscan University in order to provide a youth ministry certification for all our um, current youth advisors, our current MYO advisors, and those that are in training, hopefully that will transition into that role in the future. If you haven't already signed up, uh, please make sure that you do. If you have any questions on how to go about it, just reach out to us and we'll get you set up with that. Um, we will be reaching out to the parishes individually to make sure that everybody's taking advantage of this and to kind of track the progress um, as you go along with the different courses. Um, next month, as you know, we're doing one session a month in the six part series. Next session, session three is going to be on the topic of accompaniment. And we are blessed to have yet another great speaker joining us, Kelsey Scope. Um, she is 
very well versed in this topic. So that will be August 19th. It's also on a Wednesday, beginning again at 8.30 p.m. And look for an email to go out for registration with that shortly, probably um, early next week. Um, in the next day or two, you will be receiving an email for a survey on this presentation, um, on this topic, and also on Dr. Scott Powell providing him with feedback as well. So please make sure that when you receive that email, it'll take you no more than 60 seconds to fill out. Um, provide us as much feedback as you can. Just this will help us as we continue to plan the rest of the um, webinar sessions and any future initiatives. And lastly, um, if you haven't already, make sure that the uh, office email address, myyaoffice.gmail.com is on your list of approved senders so it doesn't go to junk every time we try to send you a message and this way you can stay well informed. Um, so those are all our announcements. Again, thank you, Dr. Scott Powell, for joining us, and thank you all for taking the time to be with us today. And God bless you. Have a great and, rest of your evening. And before we leave, can we give you a little blessing, Scott? Just thank uh, you. can we give you a little blessing, all of us together? Thanks. Yeah. Yes, please. Thank you. Everyone, just raise your hands towards Scott and for his family. Scott, may the Lord God bless you. Continue to bring so many beautiful things beautiful stories, beautiful witnesses of God's glory from you. May he bless you, your wife, your children, all of your endeavors and all your future. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you all. Take care. Bye-bye.